of this morning, we want to start uh, our winter character study. Every winter, I try to walk us through a character in the Bible. And this year, I picked the character of Joshua. Um, Joshua is my favorite character in Scripture. And uh, it's an amazing story. And we're going to take the next 13 weeks, starting today, to really walk through his life. We're going to walk through the book of Joshua. Amazing stories, amazing life application principles. And uh, I think you're going to really enjoy it. We're calling it Operation Promised Land. As we look at Joshua, who leads Israel into conquering the promised land. So let me begin this morning by just kind of giving you some introductory thoughts about Joshua. So let's start by answering the question, who is Joshua? Who is this guy? Because what we're going to do today is we're going to not even get to the book of Joshua. We're going to look at the verses in which we see Joshua before the book of Joshua. Here's what we need to know. Maybe you're new to the faith, new to the church, and uh, new to the Bible. Joshua is most known in the Bible for being a military leader. That's what he's most known for. He will lead the children of Israel into conquering the promised land. But as much as he is known for being a military leader, a lot of people overlook the fact that he was also an amazing spiritual leader. And that's really what I want to look at in this series. What made Joshua such an amazing spiritual leader? That's what we'll be looking at. Now, Understand something, I really do believe, my personal opinion here, I believe Joshua is the greatest example of leadership in all the Bible. And that was a task, and here's why. Because Joshua was the successor of Moses. Now if I were to ask any one of you, uh, who are the main characters, the pillars of the Old Testament, most all of you would name Moses as one of them. Uh, He was a pretty important guy. Pretty amazing. Can you imagine having to fill the sandals of Moses? I mean, I thought it was hard filling the sandals of Jim Mathis. Can you imagine filling the sandals of Moses? And I believe that Joshua ultimately becomes the greatest leader in the Bible. He's the son of a man named Nun. That is a man's name, N-U-N, in the Old Testament. He's from the tribe of Ephraim. And here's an interesting point. His name, Joshua, which by the way was not his birth name. Moses gave him his name. And the name literally means God saves. Jehovah saves. The Old Testament word for Jehovah saves is Joshua. Do you know what the New Testament Greek word for for, for Jehovah saves is? Jesus. Joshua has the Old Testament name that's the equivalent to the New Testament name of Jesus. What an amazing guy. Now, let me give you a little timeline because this timeline is going to be very, I think, helpful in understanding how amazing it is that this guy became a leader. So as we look at the timeline, let's kind of look at when Moses lived. Now, these dates are not exact, but they're rough. They're within, you know, a few years probably of, of if you put all the experts' opinions together. But let's just say 1875. Now, that's B.C., folks. That's not 80. That's B.C. 1875, Israel is taken into Egyptian bondage. They're going to be in Egyptian bondage for over 400 years. Starts about 1875. Uh, Pretty much about 370 some years into that, a baby is born named Joshua. He's born a slave. Joshua, for the first 55 years of his life, knew nothing but slavery. His dad knew nothing but slavery. His grandpa knew nothing but slavery. Now keep that in mind. Because he's going to become, I think, the greatest example of leadership in the Bible. And for the first 55 years, he knew nothing but slavery. The Exodus happens in 1445 B.C. Joshua would have been about 55 years old when that happened. And now for the next 40 years, what does Israel do? They wander in the wilderness, right? Because of disobedience. Only two guys, two adults at the time, are allowed to ultimately enter the promised land. Joshua and another man we'll meet later named Caleb. 
So 40 years after the Exodus, Moses dies, and in about um, 1406, Joshua takes over leadership. He would have been about 94 years old when he took over leadership. And he wasn't the leader long because he ultimately dies in about 1390 B.C. at the age of 110. Now, by the way, when we get to that 13 weeks from now, when spring will be here 13 weeks from now, maybe, just maybe, when we get to that, we're going to read the most awesome obituary ever written. It's in the Bible. I'm telling you, it's the most awesome obituary ever ever written but you got to wait 13 weeks to hear it unless you want to go look it up yourself now keep that in mind as you look at these dates for the first 94 years of his life before he takes on leadership how wonderful is joshua's life not very huh the first 55 years he's a slave the next 40 years he wanders in the wilderness Two very horrible scenarios. Now, I'm going to suggest this to you. I want to suggest to you that Joshua ultimately becomes a great leader because of the principles he learned during the 40 years he wandered in the wilderness. And had he not wandered in the wilderness those 40 years, I don't think he ever would have become a great leader. Now, why is that important? Here's why. Because folks, listen, all of us have wilderness times in our life. Some of you are entering a new year. And you're entering, entering a new year in a wilderness. You're facing a huge adversity. I know I am. I'm facing a huge adversity as I enter this new year. One that I didn't think I was going to be facing. And maybe you're in that same boat. And, and here's the thing. It's so easy for us. When we get into these wilderness times, to become discontent, to complain. Isn't that what most of Israel did during that 40 years? They just kept complaining. It's really easy for us during this time to get a little bitter at God. It's really easy for us to slip away spiritually. And folks, can I just remind you something? God brings wilderness times in your life for a purpose. And listen. The greatest lessons God wants you to learn, you will learn in the wilderness. Did you hear that? The greatest lessons God wants you to learn, you will learn in the wilderness. I'm telling you, when I look back at my life, and I haven't had a lot of wilderness in my life, but I've had some. And I can tell you this, I learned more about God in the wilderness time of my life than I ever did in the victorious times of my life. And as you go in, if you're going into a time of wilderness in this new year, as I am, if that's true, can you just be reminded that this is a very important time in your life? Do not hate the wilderness times of your life. It's the 40 years in the wilderness that prepared Joshua to be a leader. The things he learned in the wilderness made him a great leader. And I'm telling you, folks, if you will stay faithful in the wilderness... If you will keep your heart open to the lessons God wants to teach you in the wilderness, I'm telling you, on the other side of the wilderness, you will see incredible growth. That's what happens in the life of Joshua. So here's what I want to do. I want to share with you this morning, I'm going to look at four passages before we ever get to the book of Joshua. Four passages where we see Joshua before he becomes the leader, during the wilderness time. And I want to share with you four principles that I think he learned that made him a great leader that he never would have learned had he never gone through the wilderness time. You ready? Even if you're not, we're going to do it. So turn in your Bibles to Exodus 17. Exodus 17. I want to begin here. I'm just going to read off the screen. And for the sake of cameramen, producers, slide, I'll probably be stopping as I read and commenting. So have fun following. Here we go. Exodus chapter 17 says, then Amalek, I'm already going to stop, Amalek was the king of the Amalekites. The Amalekites were a very large group of people. They were powerful. They were the descendants of Esau, all right? King Amalek came and fought against Israel at Rephidim. Now, let me stop, because let me tell you how he did it. It wasn't a very nice thing. Now, remember, you have Israel. There's probably about two million of them. 
wandering through the wilderness in a caravan. Now, think about this for a second. Let's say that we took everyone in this room, okay? And we all left right now. We leave at the same time. And you're going to take my daily walk with me. We're going to walk down to McDonald's, okay? No, don't laugh. You're really going to do it. We're going to walk down to McDonald's together. Now, here's my If we all start together in a group, here's the question. Ready? Will we all get to McDonald's at the same time? No, some of you may not get there at all, you know? Some of you may be lucky to get down to the Promise FM next door. But nonetheless, we're not going to get there at the same time, are we? Right? Who's going to get there first? Yeah, me. <laughs> yeah, because I'm in shape now. <laughs> no, those who might be in shape will get there first. Maybe the younger ones will get there first. The healthier ones might get there first, right? Who's going to get there last? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> Who's going to get there last? Probably the older. Maybe those that aren't feeling real well. Those who aren't in very good shape. Those that maybe would be more vulnerable, right? So if we were walking from here to McDonald's, would we not be strewn out? The stronger ones probably in the front. The weaker ones in the back, right? Well, that's how it would have been for Israel. As they're wandering through the wilderness in this huge caravan, they get strung out, and in the back of the group, way back here, are the older folks, uh, the women, those with small children. That's who Amalek attacks. He attacks the back of the caravan. He slaughters those who could not even protect or defend themselves. So notice what Moses does as I keep reading. Isn't the Old Testament amazing? So Moses said to Joshua, now stop. Where has Israel been for the last 400 years? Where? In slavery in Egypt, right? Do they have an army? Do the Israelites have an army? No. Have they ever been trained how to fight? No. Did Joshua go to West Point to learn how to lead an army? No. Moses looks at Joshua who has no experience as a military leader. And he says to Joshua, Joshua, go grab some men who've never fought in battle before and go out and fight against mighty King Amalek and the Amalekites. And here's what I'm going to do while you're doing that. I'm going to station myself on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm Joshua, I'm saying something like this. <laughs> Time out. Why don't you go get the man and you go find Amalek and I'll go up on top of the hill with the staff of God, right? I mean, this seems like a bizarre thing, doesn't it? But notice what Joshua does. Look at this next phrase. Don't miss it. Joshua did as Moses told him. Did it make sense? No. From a human perspective, did he have a chance? No. But he did what Moses told him, and he fought against Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. Now let's keep reading and see what happens, beginning in verse number 11. So it came about when Moses held his hand up with the staff of God in it, the army of Israel, if you can call it an army, prevailed. But when his hands got tired and his arms came down, the Amalekites prevailed. And Moses' hands got heavy. I mean, how long can you keep your hands in the air holding a staff? How long could you do it? Hey, that'd be tough, wouldn't it? So they took a stone and they put it under Moses and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side, one on the other. So his hands stayed in the air and thus his hands were steady until the sun set. And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. What an amazing story. Now let's look at what we learn about the leadership of Joshua from this passage. This is the first mention of Joshua in the Bible. First time we meet him is Moses saying, hey, Joshua, shh, come here. Grab these men who've never fought and go fight that army. I'll watch from up there. That's the first time we see Joshua. He's the military leader, if you can call him that, no training, under Moses. He's involved in the battle against the Amalekites. And as long as Moses' hands were raised, Israel won. And that was God communicating to Israel and mainly to Joshua this principle. Listen, the principle is this. If you trust me, I will win your battles. That's what God's communicating. In fact, notice what happens. 
In Exodus chapter 17, if we keep reading in verse number 14, when the battle's all over, here's what happens. The Lord says to Moses, write this down in a book as a memorial. Write down what happened so that Israel always remembers why did they win the battle because of God, right? This was all a picture showing them if you trust God, he'll win your battles. But he says to Moses, don't just write it down. Look at this. Recite it to Joshua. And the word recite there means continually. You just keep telling Joshua about this. You just keep reminding Joshua about this, that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. And God, by the way, did that under the reign of King Saul later on. Now, why would God say to Moses, don't just write it down. You keep reminding Joshua of what's happened. Because it's very obvious God has already picked Joshua to be the next leader. And he is teaching Joshua that amazing lesson in the wilderness. And the lesson is this. If you will trust me, I will win your battles. If you, do you think Joshua remembered that when he got to Jericho and God said, now here's what you're going to do to take down the city. Just march around it. Just go march around the city. And I wonder if Joshua at first went, that's dumb. And then went, well, wait a second. Remember what happened with Amalek? As long as I trust God, he will win my battles. Folks, listen. That was true for Joshua, and that is true for you. As long as you trust God, listen, he will win your battles. He may not win it on your timetable. He may not even win it in this life. But I guarantee you, my friend, I guarantee you, whatever, whatever battle you're facing, I guarantee you, when you get to heaven, you will celebrate the fact that God won your battle for you. Now, what's the leadership principle that we learn from this? Here it is. Those who become great leaders must first learn how to be courageous followers. I want you to think about that. Those who become great leaders must first learn how to be courageous followers. Did you not see the courage of Joshua in following Moses in that story? Would that not have taken courage? And, and Joshua had to be going this, okay? What Moses has told me to do doesn't make sense, but I know Moses seeks God's face. And so if Moses is seeking God's face, I'm going to trust his leadership. Now, this isn't blind trust. This isn't trust your leader even if he's doing something wrong. That's not what this is. This is Joshua understanding a very important principle. You'll never be a good leader until you first learn how to be a good follower. And that is so foreign in our culture today, isn't it? Our culture doesn't follow well. We live in a culture that attacks authority. We, le we live in a culture that, that blasts authority, that's always criticizing authority, that's always rebelling against authority. And we brought that into the church, folks. Can I ask you a question? How courageously do you follow your boss at work? Teenagers, how courageously do you follow the leadership of your parents? How courageously do you follow church leadership? I'm not talking following if they're doing something wrong. I'm not, no, we, we don't follow that. I'm talking outside of that. I remember when I was an assistant pastor in Ohio at my first church I pastored. My mentor, uh, Steve Peters, was, was the pastor. And we had a wonderful relationship. But I was committed to being a good follower. And, uh, but I'll never forget, there, you know, there was one time in particular that he came up with an idea. It wasn't a right or wrong idea. It was just a dumb idea. Okay, it was just, that's what it was. And, um, and I don't have time to go into the idea. Was, but I remember sitting down with him in his office and saying, are you serious? I mean, do you really think this has a chance of working? I mean, and I showed him all the ways it could fail. And, and I lobbied and lobbied and lobbied to get him to change his mind. But at the end of the conversation, he said, Scott, I really want to do it. I said, okay. 
And even though I thought it was the dumbest idea I'd ever heard, when I left his office, I left his office the greatest cheerleader for that idea that the church had. Because if you're ever going to be a good leader, you must first learn how to be a courageous follower. How are you doing on following? How are you doing on following the authorities that are over you? Think about that. Because it's a leadership principle I believe Joshua learned when he was in the wilderness that ultimately made him a great leader. Well, let's look at another passage. Let's go to Exodus 24. Exodus 24. Here's the next time we see Joshua. All right? Now look at this. Um, Now the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain, Mount Sinai, and remain there, and I'm going to give you the stone tablets with the law and the commandment, which I've written for their instruction. So Moses arose, and don't miss this, with Joshua his servant, and Moses went up to the mountain of God, and then verse 18 says, Moses entered the midst of the cloud that represented the glory of God as he went up to the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights, and Joshua is right up there with him. Imagine that. That's amazing to think about. Joshua right up there with him. So, we saw the leadership of Joshua. Now let's take a note of the listening of Joshua. The listening of Joshua. The next time he's mentioned, he's with Moses up on Mount Sinai as Moses is meeting with God. And by the way, this is the first time he's called the servant of Moses in the Bible. Again, showing he was a courageous follower. And that's what made him ultimately a very good leader. So here's Moses up on the mountain talking with God. Joshua is nearby. I don't know if Joshua can hear the conversation, but he's nearby. All right? So what's the next principle we learn? Principle number two is this. Listen. Those who become great leaders spend time carefully observing the spiritual walk and disciplines of other great leaders. Think about those who become great spiritual leaders spend time observing the spiritual walk and disciplines of other great leaders. That's what Joshua's doing. Joshua is watching Moses, a man who talks with God face to face. He's watching his spiritual walk, he's watching his spiritual disciplines. He is studying what Moses does and that's all going to be used in his life to one day make him an amazing leader. When I think back over my life, I think of the different leaders that God brought into my life that by observing their walk it made a huge difference in my life. I think of my own dad. My dad, as I observed my dad growing up, I observed a man who was faithfully committed to the local church. My dad wasn't a pastor, but my dad was on every committee, every board, sang in the choir, and he was the church janitor, okay? He might as well have been the pastor too. He wasn't the pastor, but he was all those other things. My dad loved the local church. His life revolved around it. His job was something that made money so he could serve in the local church. He loved it. All through his life, he loved the local church. To this day, he loves the local church. And growing up watching that, I began to develop in my heart a passion for the local church. I love the local church. I've had opportunities in my ministry career to go work for parachurch ministries. And they're wonderful ministries, but that's not my heart. My heart's the local church. I believe with all my heart that the local church is God's plan for this age. I believe the local church is the hope of the world. I believe there's nothing like the local church when the local church is working right. And I believe that the best days of the local church are still ahead of us. I believe it. And I developed that love and I developed that passion by watching the leadership of my dad. I think of a Sunday school teacher I had in high school named Rick Matthew, whose passion was sharing Jesus. And I learned a passion about sharing Jesus with others from watching the leadership of Rick Matthew. 
I think about my high school band director, Don Bechtel. Uh, he was the first person I confided in when I felt God was calling me to be a pastor. I told Don Bechtel, and I'll never forget his response. He smiled, he looked at me, he said, that's great, Scott. Now listen, let me give you a piece of advice. I said, what? He said, if there's anything else you would rather do, anything at all, do it instead. That was his advice. I learned from Don Bechtel. That just because it's Christian doesn't mean it has to be mediocre. We can shoot for excellence to the glory of God in everything we do. I learned it by watching his walk, his discipline. When I went off to Liberty University, I, I, I studied and watched the leadership of my supervisor, Harry Walls. And from him, I learned how to pray. I watched the discipline and leadership of, of a professor of mine named Paul Fink, who's with the Lord today. And from him, I learned how to study my Bible. I watched Dr. Jerry Falwell while I was there. and I learned what it means to have a vision, to see God do big things. All of those things were learned by carefully observing the spiritual walk and disciplines of others. Can I ask you a question? What spiritual leader are you watching? What spiritual leader are you carefully observing their disciplines so that you can glean from them, catch things from them that will allow you to improve your leadership? You say, I'm not a leader. Every one of you is a leader because leadership is influence and every one of you influences somebody. Every single one of you is a leader. What are you doing to improve that? What book are you reading that's a great biography of a great Christian from the past? I remember when I read D.L. Moody's biography. And the quote he made has become my favorite non-biblical quote when he said, if God be your partner, make your plans large. You know what I, why I believe Joshua became a great leader? Because for 40 years in the wilderness time of his life, when he could have been sulking and in self-pity and turning bitter and complaining, he instead carefully observed the spiritual walk and spiritual discipline of a great man of God named Moses. Isn't that a great principle? Well, let, let's look at another one. Go down to Numbers 11. And let me read beginning in verse number 24. Let me read this. L look at this. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. Okay, that's what Moses did, right? God spoke to Israel through Moses. God would tell Moses, Moses would tell the people. But one day, God did it differently. Look what happens. So he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and stationed them around the tent. Now stop, let me explain the tent. This is called the tent of meeting, and here's what Moses did. Moses always set up a tent outside of the camp. That's where he would go to meet with God, in the tent. So in the tent, he now has 70 elders to come out around the tent. And the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to Moses. And the same spirit was upon these 70 elders. And when the spirit rested on them, they prophesied. They spoke for God, but notice they never did it again. It was a one-time occurrence that God also spoke through these 70 men. Now, let's call this one the loyalty of Joshua. Now, keep in mind what's going on here. Uh, as we Let me read verse 26 first. But the two men... Two of the men remained in the camp. The other elders went out to the tent of meeting. Two men remained in the camp. Their names are Eldad and Medad. And the spirit rested on them. Now they weren't, they weren't out there with the other 70 elders at, at the tent. They're in the camp. So a young man ran and told Moses and said, Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Is this good or is this bad? Now stop for a second. Let me explain what's going on. Notice the loyalty of Joshua. Notice this. What's happening is God speaks through Moses, but on this one occasion, God uses 70 elders. But two men also who aren't part of that group begin to prophesy in the camp. And word comes to Moses. And who's standing next to Moses? The guy that's always standing next to Moses, Joshua. Now Joshua doesn't like this. He doesn't like it. In fact, let me read now as we keep reading in verse number 28. 
Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the attendant of Moses from his youth, said, Moses, my Lord, restrain those two guys. Tell them to quit. Tell them to quit. Now, why did Joshua say that? Well, we learn his reasoning in Moses' response. And Moses said to Joshua, are you jealous for my sake? You know what happened? Joshua thought these two guys were usurping Moses' authority. And Joshua was loyal to Moses. We're not talking blind loyalty. We're not talking do whatever your leader says, even if it's wrong. You, listen, can I just make sure you understand this? Leaders make mistakes. Do you realize that? Do not just follow your leader blindly. If your leader is doing something wrong, you do not follow them. All right? But in this case, Moses wasn't doing something wrong. Joshua thought these men were usurping his authority. You know why Joshua would think that? Because since the beginning of time, folks, there have always been people in every group gunning for the leader. If you go back and read the story of Israel wandering in the wilderness, you will see that happening many, many, many times. That people were gunning to take down Moses. They were gunning to replace Moses. And that happens. It's human nature. It happens today. It happens in the world. And, folks, it happens in the church. I'll never forget one day hearing a preacher say this. There's always a Judas in your life. And they're usually close enough to kiss you. Think about it. And I think that's true. There'll always be people gunning for the leader. That's why, by the way, folks, that's why most pastors, though they put on a pretty good front, are usually insecure inside. And that's why they don't have a lot of close friends because they don't know who they can trust. Now, that's part of what comes with leadership. It just really is. But would to God that every spiritual leader had a Joshua in their life. A guy who would say, listen, my leader may not be perfect, and my leader may make some really dumb decisions at times. And when he does, I tell him. But let me tell you something. I'm loyal to him because God has made him the leader. Imagine how the church would function if we looked at that throughout the ministry. So when the guy who leads the youth does something that you don't like the way they're doing it, but it's not wrong, you say, you know what, that's not the way I would do it. But God put him as the leader. I'm going to back him. And when the children's director does something that, that you don't think that's the best way to do it, but it's not wrong, we would say, you know what, that's not the way I would do it, and I can even tell him that, but at the end of the day, he's who God put in place, I'm going to back him. Joshua learned that incredible lesson. And that's principle number three. Those who become great leaders know the importance of being loyal in following their own leaders. Joshua learned that not during the victory time of his life. He learned that during the wilderness time of his life. I'm telling you folks, God brings wilderness times in your life to teach you the lessons you need to succeed in the future. And if you'll learn the lessons in the wilderness, you will succeed in the future. Let me show you one more with the time we have remaining. Go to Exodus 33. We've seen the leadership of Joshua, the listening of Joshua, the loyalty of Joshua. Now let me read verses 7 through 11. We're, we're going to be back to that tent of meeting I told you about. Ready? Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, a good distance from the camp. He called it the tent of meeting. Verse 9 says, whenever Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent and the Lord would speak with Moses. That's where God went, where Moses went to speak with God. He went inside the tent and the pillar of cloud would come down symbolizing that God was meeting with Moses. Now what did the children of Israel do in the camp when they saw this happening outside the camp at the tent? Well, let's keep reading. When all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance, they knew that meant... They knew that meant God was talking to Moses. What did they do? They would arise and they would each worship at their own tent. Now, I love this because you know what? Folks, this is incredible. The children of Israel understood something. It's a very good thing when the leader talks with God. It's a very good thing. And when they saw Moses talking with God, the people worshiped. Because the best thing that can ever happen to an organization is for that organization to have a leader that talks with God. The best thing that can happen to a church 
is for that church to have elders who talk with God. The best thing that can happen to a family is for that family to have parents who talk with God. Look at this. They would each worship. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face just as a man speaks to his friend. We could preach on that one all day, but we're not talking about Moses. When Moses returned to the camp, look at this. His servant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moses would go out to the tent. Joshua would be out there because Joshua's wherever Moses is. So Joshua's outside the tent. Moses is in the tent talking with God. All the people are at their tents worshiping. And when Moses gets done talking with God, Moses goes back inside the camp and Joshua stays there. He stays there. Now what principle can we learn from this? I think it's powerful. We're going to see the Lord of Joshua here. He stays there even after Moses leaves. And here's the principle we learn. Those who make good leaders spend extraordinary amounts of time with God and desire God in even greater ways than their own leaders did. Now let me read that again. Those who become great leaders spend extraordinary amounts of time with God and desire to know God in even greater ways than their own leaders did. Even after Moses left, Joshua stayed. Do you see the desire in Joshua's life? He has seen and tasted what it's like up close to see a man who talks with God. And Joshua says, I want that. I'm not leaving this tent. I want that in my life. In fact, let me give you one more example of that in the Bible. It comes from 2 Kings chapter 2. You have the leader, Elijah, and his student, Elisha. And Elijah is about ready to be taken into heaven. And he says to Elisha, make any request you want. And look at the request he makes. I love it. When they had crossed over, Elijah said to Elisha, ask what I shall do for you before I'm taken. And Elisha said, here's my request. Please let a double portion of your spirit be on me. Man, Elijah, I saw how God used you. He even used you to call fire down from God on Mount Carmel. And Elijah, I got such a taste of that that my desire is to see God use me in twice the way he used you. That wasn't Elisha saying, I want to one-up you. That's not what he's doing. He's saying, I caught something from you. And what I caught from you, your ceiling, I want to be my floor. Man, I hope that happens. I hope that my kids and my grandkids will ultimately love and serve Jesus much more than I do. I hope those that fill our children's ministries and nursery will ultimately be sitting in here as adults more passionate about Jesus than we are. Joshua learned that in the wilderness. And that's what made Joshua ultimately the greatest leader, I believe, in all the Bible. Would you bow with me for prayer? And, and I just want you, would you just do something just real easy, it's real simple, with our heads bowed, eyes closed, would you just whisper this prayer in your heart? Would you just say, God, what are you saying to me this morning? What are you saying to me? What do you want me to change? If you ask him, he'll show you. We went over a lot of principles. Would you ask God that right now? And before I pray with our heads bowed, our eyes closed. How many of you this morning would say, Pastor Scott, as I enter this new year, I am entering in a wilderness in my life. And I'd like you to pray for me. Would you just lift your hand? Just lift it. All over. Would you stand as I pray? So Father, my heart is just overflowing this morning because you showed me so much and I have no idea if I communicated it in a way that 
made sense or not. But that's why I'm thankful that when we're weak, you're strong. And that really I'm not the teacher, your spirit is. And I'm just trusting that your spirit could take the words that I spoke, could take the passages that we read, and burn them into each individual's heart in a unique way. That when we leave here today, we'll leave here changed. And God, I pray for those that are here watching online, down at the chapel at our Sioux campus, TV, radio, who are going through wilderness times in their life as we enter this new year. Those are tough times. God, I know I'm there too. But I also know this, from experience and from the word, you use wilderness times in our life. There is a purpose for every pain. And if we will focus on you, you will teach us lessons in the wilderness that will make us successful in the future. And if we trust you, you will win our battles. And that Victory may not come on our timetable, but that's okay because your timing is not usually our timing, but your timing is always the best timing. And that victory may not even happen on this earth, but it will happen. And someday we will praise you because you won the victory. And we'll see it. So I'm thankful as we enter the new year that no matter what we're facing, or will face. You are faithful. It's a new year. But it's the same God. And your faithfulness is great. Your mercies are new every morning. Your compassions never fail. Great. Is your faithfulness. And I pray this in Jesus name.